our speakers this afternoon have met with some of you from time to time, but a number of you have not yet met our speakers, so you're in for quite a pleasure and an informative pleasure, I should say. Um, but um, what's going to happen, I think, uh, when you hear Professor Singer, who will be our first speaker. Professor Singer is Bass Professor uh, at, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Professor Singer is Ingram Professor, uh, DeCamp Professor at uh, Princeton University, uh, and also Laureate Professor at the University of Melbourne. Uh, he has a joint appointment and splits his time between both places to the good fortune of the United States and Australia. Uh, and uh, Professor Singer will speak to us first about uh, the ethical uses, the proper uses of animals. To what extent are we as humans uh, entitled to exploit animals for our own purposes, whether those purposes be nutritional or those purposes be purposes of research? And then after uh, uh, we hear about uh, animals and animal exploitation, uh, we'll turn our attention uh, more directly to genetic engineering. So, uh, Professor Singer, uh, if you would chat with us first. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Um, I just want to speak uh, briefly uh, to outline some of the issues in this topic. I know some of you have heard me speak today, but others haven't. Uh, but I also want to make sure that we have plenty of time for Professor Sandel and, and uh, I to, ha to have a uh, discussion, to talk about the issues, which will be different, I hope, for all of you. So um, why do animals raise an ethical issue? I think, uh, essentially, we should recognize that we are not the only beings on this planet who have lives that can go well or badly. And that's the basic point that we very often overlook in our attitudes to animals. Let me um, start maybe by raising a slightly different question, and which is really what, what led me first to think about the question of animals. Uh, as philosophers, um, we often discuss the question of equality. What is it that we really mean when we say all humans are equal? How can we justify that statement? Because once we start to think about that philosophically, once we go beyond the idea of uh, thinking of it as a nice piece of rhetoric uh, that we can sign declarations about, uh, it's obvious that human beings differ in a whole lot of capacities, a whole lot of ways. Almost anything you can think of that might be morally relevant, human beings are different. Uh, you try and see how fast they can run uh, a mile, they'll differ in that. You try and see how well uh, they can shoot a basketball, they'll differ in that. You try and see how well they can solve math problems, they'll differ in that. You try and measure how likely are they respond to respond to somebody in need, how altruistic they are they, they'll differ in that. Uh, essentially, everything that you can, you can think of that you could measure in some way, human beings will differ. Yet we still say humans are equal. We still think there's some important fundamental moral principle about human equality. What can be left that makes us equal? Well, to, to cut a very long story short, I think that when you explore all the suggestions that have been made, the one that most plausibly remains is that we are all beings with interests. We are all beings whose lives can go well or badly, uh, so that uh, there are things that matter to us um, about how our lives might go. And what's wrong with those views that we've taken as uh, inegalitarian, typically, say, racist views or sexist views or, or something of that sort, is that they have given less uh, weight to the interests of others who are outside the preferred group. So, Racists typically would give less weight, less to, to the interests of members of other races, uh, and, and you can think of other ways in which this has been the case. But if that's true, if I'm right in saying that that's really the sort of the solid rock basis of, of human equality, then we, can, uh, we, we have to go back to the point that I mentioned right at the beginning. We're not the only beings on this planet with interests. We're not the only beings on this planet whose lives can go well or badly. And 
uh, I think that when we say all humans are equal, although this is a very progressive idea, when we m say that as a counter against racists or sexists, um, it also, unthinkingly perhaps, we exclude all of these other beings on the planet. We exclude other beings who have interests and whose lives can go well or badly. And uh, from that aspect, I think we're, we're saying something which actually we can't really defend. So I don't think we can draw a line around our own species and say these are the beings who matter. These are the beings who are entitled to some equality or are entitled to a whole set of rights, which we call human rights. And if you're not a member of this group, you don't have that moral status. You, you're not entitled to equal consideration. Uh, I think that the basic principle, the principle of equal consideration of interests, has to be one that extends to all beings who have interests, at least all beings who have, are conscious, can feel pain, whose lives can go well or badly from, for them from their own perspective. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that uh, there are no differences between beings that um, roughly, very roughly, uh, are related to, to species differences. So that a, at least a typical mature human may have interests that non-humans don't have. Uh, people here living in, in Amherst um, may have a range of interests that might involve, for example, going down to New York to uh, uh, listen to the opera or a concert or going to the theatre or just um, you know, enjoying the, the sights of the crowds on Fifth Avenue. Uh, on the other hand, you may have some cattle grazing in the fields around here which have no such interests. So their interest could be met by living peacefully in fields around uh, this area. Uh, perhaps your interests cannot be fully met. So, so we, we recognise, of course, that there are differences. But where we're talking about similar interests, where we're talking about interest in uh, not suffering, in uh, having uh, a life that's a life that can content you and so on, um, I think we are not justified in saying because beings are not humans, uh, we're, not, uh, uh, we can, we're entitled to disregard their interests. So obviously this sets standards on how we can use non-human animals. Uh, uh, basically it says we can't use them in ways that fail to give the proper weight to the interests that they do have. So um, if we're considering a piece of scientific research that we wish to perform on uh, non-human animals, we can't just say, well, here's something that might benefit humans uh, and animals are available, so let's just get a batch of animals and uh, do the research tested on animals. Uh, we, would have, we, we should have a much more stringent standard of, of uh, requirement which says how does this affect the interests of animals? Um, does it affect them adversely? If so, are there other things we can do, other ways in which we can advance our goal without affecting their interests adversely? Uh, and we should certainly explore those options and see what the possibilities are. Now, we might, of course, get to a point where we say, well, we've tried everything else, but we have still reached a point where either this research is not going to be done or it's going to be done and animal interests are going to be harmed. How could, we, how could we decide whether we have given the proper weight to animals in those circumstances? I think that there's an, at, at least a, a hypothetical test here, and it, it's a test that may seem shocking to some of you. But because I believe that uh, we're wrong to discriminate against the interests of, of non-human animals where they're similar to, to those of human beings, uh, I would say that we, if we think that research is justified on animals, we ought to think that it's justified on humans who would suffer in a similar way and only in a similar way. Now, that comparison may often be different to, difficult to make because normal humans uh, have, as I said, different abilities and perhaps uh, have different kinds of anticipation of suffering, different memories of suffering, different kind of awareness of what's happening to them, maybe are capable of being humiliated or having their dignity affronted in ways that would not apply to non-human animals. But that's not true of all animals. Uh, sorry, that's not true of all humans. Um, 
there are humans who are uh, intellectually disabled to the point where their capacities for the things that I just mentioned do not surpass those of non-human animals. So if an experimenter thinks that an experiment is justified on non-human animals, I think he or she ought to think that it would also be justified to perform that on humans at a similar level of development. Uh, that is, that there shouldn't be a, simply a difference of species that says it's okay to use one kind of being and not another. There may be other practical differences, certainly there are legal differences why that can't be done, but at least as a thought experiment, that's one way I would suggest of determining the limits and your sincerity in saying that you're not influenced by a bias of species in deciding that animals can be used here uh, because the experiment is so important that it outweighs the adverse effects on the interests of animals. Now, um, having said that, and I said I didn't want to go on too long, um, I did want to say something about, uh, a little more about the, the issue of, of animals and research, as I think that perhaps connects in some ways better with the, the, the common theme that Professor Sandel and I are discussing. But I also want to say this. If you're um, moved by the general principle that I've talked about of uh, equal consideration of interests and uh, avoiding the bias of speciesism, of, of thinking that just because a being is a member of our species, uh, somehow it's automatically got an elevated moral status, then you should be aware that while the issue of research on animals is a significant issue in that something like 25 to 40 million animals are used for research in this country each year, the issue of the use of animals for food is a far larger issue. Far larger in terms of numbers because about 10 billion animals are killed for food in this country each year, dwarfing the number used for experiments. And also an issue that in which the quantity of suffering is much greater because, because of intensive farming, I think actually you know, if you had to choose between being reincarnated as, let's say, a, a, an egg-laying hen in a factory farm or a rat in a laboratory that was eventually going to get sacrificed for an experiment, although both of them would be pretty awful fates, I think uh, the suffering of the rat might be more acute but is certainly a much shorter duration. You'd probably do better to be the rat than the hen. So I think the quantity of suffering is vastly greater. And finally, the justification is much weaker because for at least some scientific research, I don't think this is true by any means of all scientific research, but at least some scientific research can be defended in terms of advancing our knowledge of uh, major diseases or problems that uh, face us which have a large cost, a, a, a unavoidable cost in terms of death and suffering to large numbers of human beings. That no such necessity can be provided for the food industry that raises and kills animals for food. It overall does not increase the amount of food available to us. It reduces it because we grow vast quantities of grain and soybeans to feed to animals and in the process of simply living they burn up most of the food value that we feed them and we get back just a small fraction of the food value that we put into them. So it's not necessary in any sense for producing our food. Um, and uh, uh, it's, there are available alternatives which are both, as I say, more efficient, also more environmentally friendly. Uh, the livestock industry produces more greenhouse gas emissions globally than the entire transport sector, all kinds of transport. Um, so globally, uh, from a climate change point of view, we'd be better to reduce our meat consumption. Um, and uh, uh, from a health point of view, uh, there certainly are costs from the high quantity of animal uh, products that we consume. So let me close by saying to you, uh, I think there are the limits of animal use. Um, uh, there are strict eth ethical limits on what we can justifi justifiably do to animals. And uh, while they certainly apply and lead to difficult decisions in the area of the use of animals in research, uh, I think they ought to actually lead to the abolition, at least, of large-scale intensive farming, factory farming, uh, as it exists today, which is a much larger enterprise than the use of animals for research. And also, finally, one that each of us can 
contribute towards reducing by our personal consumption choices, which is not something that each of us can do in the area of the use of animals and research. I'll stop there. Thank you very much. I want to thank Professor Singer very much. He's certainly given us food for thought. In fact, I might say something to chew on. Uh, you might not have all looked at uh, the use of animals for food uh, in quite the same terms that I think you've got to look at it after Professor Singer's remarks. We turn now to the consideration of powerful new technologies uh, of genetic engineering and the uh, contemplation of the use of those technologies uh, for the alteration, some of us might say for the improvement, for the perfection of human beings and to comment on these potential applications. Uh, we ha are very fortunate to have Professor Michael Sandel from Harvard University. He's vast professor of government there. And Professor Sandel is going to address these topics for us. Thank you. Well, we've, we've had, it's, been, it's a great pleasure to have been here for this very intense and stimulating and demanding day of colloquia uh, and exchange with uh, the Amherst College students and faculty, uh, as, as well as with my friend Professor Singer. And we were invited, each of us, to talk about a somewhat different topic, which we've done. We've discharged, I think, that responsibility. Professor Singer has been talking about uh, animal ethics, the ethical treatment of animals, and I've been focusing mainly on genetic engineering, the use of biotechnology for enhancement of human beings. But there are some common threads, I think, in our respective arguments about these different topics. And since our assignment here this afternoon is to engage with one another, I would like to say something about what I take to be the common threads, the points of agreement and disagreement, and then perhaps we'll have an exchange about it. I want to begin by saying that I agree very much, first on the subject of ethical limitations on the treatment of animals, I agree with two of the central points of emphasis of Professor Singer. First, that there are ethical limitations on uh, the way we treat animals, and in particular, that the uh, cruelties and the sufferings uh, that are perpetrated in factory industrial farming are morally objectionable. And uh, Professor Singer has really been a world leader in bringing attention to the problem of factory farms and the ethical treatment of animals. And I agree very much with his uh, case against them. I also agree with part of the philosophical uh, apparatus or argument that Professor Singer brings to bear in arguing for ethical limitations on the treatment of animals his opposition to what he calls speciesism, the idea that there is, for moral purposes, a complete and utter separation between human beings on the one hand and non-human animals on the other. I think he's right that that, uh, th to, he's right to remind us that we do have moral obligations not only to other human beings, but also to animals. So we agree on those two fundamental ideas. But I think we disagree, and here I'd like to see whether I'm on the right track here, to detect a disagreement about the underlying reasons, the underlying ethic, uh, the philosophical reasons um, that um, the two of us bring to bear in thinking both about animals, the treatment of animals, and also about the subject of genetic engineering for enhancement. Let me just summarize very briefly, some of you have been at other parts of this day of colloquia. Let me summarize the argument that I've tried to make against the use of genetic technologies and bioengineering 
for human beings for the purposes of enhancement. I distinguish between using genetic technologies to promote health, to cure, to repair injury. Stem cell research, for example, is something that I'm very much in favor of. It's a way of using new genetic technologies and discoveries to advance human health and to combat disease. I think that's uh, entirely to be encouraged and welcomed. What I'm critical of is the use of new genetic technologies, not for medical purposes, but for purposes of non-medical enhancement. For example, to use genetic technologies, which can be done today, to choose whether to have a boy or a girl. It's possible now to choose in advance the sex of one's child. And people have historically had strong desires to choose a boy or a girl, usually, alas, They've wanted boys, and now through the use of pre-implantation genetic diagnosis or embryo screening, it's possible with 100% certainty to do that, also through sperm sorting and other techniques. And though it isn't possible now, it's easy to imagine the desire to use whatever new genetic knowledge and technologies we may acquire, not just to choose the sex of your child, but also to enhance the intelligence or the physical strength um, of the child, the height to pick and choose the hair color or eye color. Why would people want to do this? Well, we see already with even the use of human growth hormone, which is a, um, is a drug that is used to uh, treat children with a hormone deficiency who are very short. Parents of perfectly healthy but short children go to the pediatrician and say, my child is short. There's nothing wrong with him. It usually is a him in the case of the, those who seek out health enhancement. He wants to play on the basketball team. Or maybe it's the parent who wants him to play on the basketball team. It's sometimes hard to know, why can't he also have the human growth hormone? That's enhancement. That's not health. And yet it's hard the FDA had to wrestle with the question of whether to approve the use of human growth hormone uh, for those who simply wanted to be taller rather than for those who had a medical or, or hormonal uh, deficiency. So why shouldn't, why shouldn't uh, genetic technologies be available to parents who want to pick and choose the genetic traits and to manipulate the genetic traits of their children for enhancement, to improve their well-being, to make their lives go better, to be more successful, to keep, compete more effectively in an intensely competitive society, whether to be taller or stronger or more handsome or to have greater uh, intelligence. Well, the reason, and here I will just quickly summarize the reason that it's, that seems to me morally troubling, and I think most of us are one way or another, uneasy about that kind of use of genetic technologies. I think the reason that we shrink from the idea of genetically empowered, technologically empowered designer parents is that there is something important about the good of the parent-child relationship. What makes it special and precious is that Parents, good parents, accept their children as they come. They don't design them. We pick and choose our friends, even our spouses, on the basis of qualities that we like or find attractive. But we don't pick and choose our children. We accept them as they come. And that fact about the parent-child relation teaches something important that is actually a quality difficult to come by with few resources in modern society, which is a certain humility, a, a humility in the face of what's, what's given. The ideal of unconditional love of parents for children teaches parents to be open to the unbidden. We live in a society and in a moral culture where in most parts of our lives, we aspire to a, to a kind of mastery, to control in our careers, in our professions, in our everyday pursuits as students. We 
think of being free and being successful as exerting our will, our control, over everything we can manage to control. But that is a partial human ideal, that aspiration to mastery or dominion. It's a kind of Promethean aspiration. And while it has fueled important human discoveries, especially in the realm of science and medicine, it also lends itself in certain domains to overreaching, to a kind of hubris. And one area where we see already a kind of overreaching and hubris is in the heavily managed childhoods that hyperparents of our day are prone to create, to mold, to form, to push. We know about hyperparenting, even low tech hyperparenting. That seems to me a kind of, it's, it's a defect in our moral culture. It's a tendency we should lean against. And the way to lean against it is to remind ourselves of the moral importance of being open to the unbidden. And that's why the unconditional love of parents for children not ma matters not only for the welfare of the children, but also for the character, for the virtue, for the habits of mind, for the dispositions of parents as parents, and for human beings generally, because that kind of openness to what is unbidden is important in other realms of life as well. So that's my argument against genetic engineering for enhancement. But I want to turn now to the difference, as I see it, in the underlying philosophical orientations that Professor Singer and I would bring to bear both on the question of the treatment of animals and on the question of genetic engineering for enhancement. As I understand Professor Singer's view, what matters is that we are all being with, beings with interests. We all, human beings and animals, have lives that can go well or badly. And so we should give equal consideration to interests, equal weight to similar interests. Animals have interests in avoiding pain and suffering, and so we should include in our moral calculus consideration of that fact about them. Lying behind this idea is a certain view that everything worth caring about, everything that contributes to lives going well, can be captured in the language or in the concept of interests or of welfare or of utility or of the balance of pleasure over pain. This is an underlying uh, utilitarian idea. And it explains why we should care about pain and suffering of animals. I think we should care, but I don't think the reason we should care is fully captured by the utilitarian calculus of pleasure and pain and welfare and uh, satisfaction and suffering for two reasons. First, I think it wrongly assumes that the, that the fundamental good that we should aim at is unitary a single thing that can be captured or summed up and compared in the language of interests or utility or welfare maximization. Um, it seems to me that the goods that we rightly cherish and prize and seek are plural, not singular, and they can't all be translated into a single uniform measure of pleasure and pain, utility and disutility, uh, welfare uh, and the like. Uh, there, are, there are many ways of valuing. Use is one, but so are respect, honor, reverence, awe, love, to name half a dozen that can't be translated, it seems to me, into welfare or utility or use. A second way of describing the question I would raise about the utilitarian background principle is that the way of valuing that's characteristic of the utilitarian principle is use and weighing up, toting up, calculating uh, the, the interests. What the reason I would say that we should, there are ethical limitations on our treatment of animals, is that there is that regarding the universe or the world or the natural world, or for that matter, animals, but not only animals, is open to any use provided it satisfies the, the maximizing principle 
of, of least pain, most pleasure. The reason we should care about that is that the world, the natural world, is not just at our disposal. The proper stance of human beings toward the natural world should include not only mastery and dominion and use and manipulation, the Promethean stance, but also a certain restraint, a certain restraint that reminds, by which we remind ourselves that to live a good life is not to consider that everything, including animals, are simply at our disposal, objects of our will or of our dominion. Let me give four quick concrete examples of how these two different approaches, the utilitarian one and the ethic of restraint, as I would call my view, make a difference. First, in the uh, case of desi designer children, What's wrong with enhancing, say, the height and the intelligence and the athletic ability and the music ability of children if it made their lives go better, if it increased their welfare, their happiness, and didn't, didn't decrease somebody else's more than it increased theirs, then it would be morally defensible on the utilitarian view. But maximizing welfare isn't the only thing that matters morally. Consider traditional eugenics, not the free market privatized eugenics where individual parents choose the genetic traits. Traditional eugenics was the attempt to control the genetic traits to improve the genetic traits of societies as a whole. And they often included forced sterilization laws. Most American states in the 1920s and 30s had laws for forced sterilization, why? to improve the gene pool, to make people better. And so so-called imbeciles and criminals and feeble-minded people were subject to forced sterilization. Now, on the utilitarian calculus, is there anything wrong in principle with eugenic laws mandating forced sterilization? It causes unhappiness. Now, you'd have to do it painlessly because if it were very painful, that would inflict suffering. And that might lead to a net disutility. But suppose the sterilization were not painful. It could be done painlessly. And suppose it really did improve the, or enhance the genetic composition or the level of intelligence and accomplishment of the society. Would a utilitarian have any grounds for rejecting it? That's question number one that I would put to Professor Singer. Question number two, if you accept an ethic of restraint rather than the utilitarian calculus, it seems to me you would be concerned not just with animals capable of feeling pain. You might also recognize that certain human uses of the natural world, of the non-animal natural world, are morally troubling. Take an example of an ancient sequoia tree. A thoughtless hiker carves his initials wantonly, just for the fun of it into an ancient sequoia tree. Isn't there something wrong with that? It seems to me there is. Now, let's assume, you might say, well, passers-by might have their utility diminished if too many of them saw and disliked this carving in the sequoia tree. But suppose it were deep in the forest, and the person who carved the initials derived more pleasure than the passers-by derived disutility seeing it. On the utilitarian calculus, since the sequoia tree doesn't suffer pain, physical pain, it's not clear to me there is any objection in principle to that. And yet, if you think there is something to an ethic of restraint, the world is not simply at our disposal, you will have a way of explaining why there is something that's not so good about something, in fact, morally dubious about carving the initials in the ancient sequoia, independent of any concern about the pain, let's assume it's probably as true. Someone can maybe prove me wrong that the tree doesn't feel pain. Question number two for Professor Singer. Is that OK, provided the acceptance so far as the passerby don't, passers don't like it? Number three, chickens 
who are confined in battery cages. Professor Singer spoke about them and showed some vivid slides. And he's surely right that there is something wrong with that way of raising and using chickens. But suppose there were a way genetically of altering chickens to remove their impulse to roam, to roam freely. Now, part of the frustration, part of the suffering of chickens in battery cages is that their natural desire to roam freely is frustrated, and so they experience pain. But suppose you could genetically alter them to make factory farming more convenient, more economical. You would have to worry less about the pecking. They'd be maybe less stressed, and so actually, I don't know, lay more eggs or something like that. So you actually, you genetically alter them to serve human purposes, cheap chickens, cheap eggs, not by changing the battery cages, but by changing, genetically tweaking, the nature of the chicken by removing that desire. They're no longer frustrated. Let's say that you could do it in a way that they wouldn't even feel pain, or if they did, it would be now so small that the pleasure derived from the efficiency of human beings uh, having cheap eggs would outweigh the small discomfort. You lessen the discomfort. And still, wouldn't there be something morally troubling about genetically altering or creating a sedentary, less frustrated, a sedentary chicken? It seems to me on the ethic of restraint, there is a way of accounting for what is morally disquieting about that, whereas on the utilitarian ethic, you make the chicken happier. Question number three for Professor Singer. The final one is this. It's an example, a wonderful example, that he presented in his colloquium. He mentioned dog fighting and cock fighting. And uh, normally, we kind of recoil when we hear practices of uh, instances of dog fighting and cock fighting. And we recoil, I think, for two reasons. One of them. Uh, is in line with the utilitarian idea. Well, it causes pain. Pain to these dogs or these uh, roosters that are being put in a pit and people are betting and cheering and watching and laughing while they're destroying one another. And surely that's part of what's objectionable. But here's what's wrong with the utilitarian way of thinking. Suppose right here, this actually probably looks like the pit of, I, not that I've been. <laughs> But it, wouldn't it be something like that? Yeah, so the ch chickens or the dogs would be there. Now, there are how many of us here? There may be a couple of hundred people here. And let's assume that everyone here were delirious with pleasure at the sight of those dogs or those chickens fighting right here. At a certain point, now you might say, well, the pain is so intense suffered by the, the roosters. Is that what they are, roosters? Uh, yeah, yeah, if you're talking about All right. right. So. Um, if the pain is intense enough, the fact that you all like it, that we all like it, it probably isn't enough. Our pleasure isn't quite enough to outweigh the intensity of the pain. On the other hand, we could deal with that ethically by moving to a bigger room. And if there were, instead of 200 people, 1,000 people, or 2,000 people, or let's go to the Colosseum in ancient Rome and put them there, tens of thousands of people cheering and really loving it, then the intense suffering of those chickens would be outweighed on the utilitarian calculus by the pleasure of the onlookers. And if there are enough people having enough fun and excitement and pleasure, then on the utilitarian calculus or the welfare calculus, it would seem that it suddenly becomes morally permissible. And why stop with cockfighting and dogfighting? Think of the Roman Colosseum. They weren't using uh, roosters and, and dogs. They, had, they threw Christians to lions for sport in the Colosseum. Now, that's abhorrent. Even before we get into debate over animal rights and ethics, of course, we would all deplore that. But if you take seriously the utilitarian way of moral reasoning that Professor Singer appeals to, it's the right conclusions on these cases of factory farms. I agree. But the reasoning is wrong. And the way you can see that the reasoning is wrong is imagining how the moral calculus would go. Yes, 
Those Christians thrown to the lions in the Colosseum suffer intense pain. But look at the collective ecstasy of the Romans, packing the Colosseum, cheering. Do we really want to say that if there are enough Romans in the Colosseum getting enough pleasure, that the pain of the Christians thrown, thrown to the lions is morally outweighed by the happiness of those in the crowd. Question number four to Professor Singer. Now you're going to get your chance to ask questions and your comments are going to be welcome, but, but you've been preempted by, by our speakers who, who kind of want to talk among themselves. So why don't you talk among yourselves and perhaps Professor Singer, you would start off. Thank you very much, and, and thanks, uh, Professor Sandel, for very challenging uh, uh, remarks, which I think you're right, do go to the heart of the differences between us on, on both of these issues, because uh, I haven't said anything yet about what you've been talking about, about um, uh, designer children, um, but you're right that I don't really share your objections to... Uh, this, I mean, I, I, I suppose, let me say, I share some of your objections again, as, as you accept some of my case. I certainly think that there are worries about tendencies like hyperparenting, um, because I think that puts pressure on children, makes uh, everything very competitive, probably doesn't give them the ideal childhood, and uh, maybe has other consequences for the way in which uh, society evolves. So I can certainly agree with that. I'm also concerned about some of the things that you talk about, a market-based uh, market based genetic selection, where, for example, you talked in your earlier session, there is the statistical evidence that people who are taller actually earn more. It's not quite clear whether this is a correlation or causation. I think we haven't really done studies that would separate that. Um, but let's assume that parents are influenced by this and therefore in some way select or genetically engineer their children to be taller, um, clearly what we get into then is a kind of an arms race, right? I mean, the, the average height just increases. Uh, it's it's a, a relative advantage. No one's thinking that there's an absolute advantage in having taller children. Um, and even if you want them to play basketball, well, it'll be no good being seven feet tall. That'll just be ordinary. You've got to be at least seven foot six and so on. Um, and then we're going to have problems in terms of, you know, no doubt we'll have problems with actual physical problems with those very tall children. We also just will be bigger people, we'll consume more resources, we have more pressure. I don't, you know, I think there's good reasons to object to purely market-based uh, genetic enhancement. Uh, but there may be other characteristics that are not just relative goods. There m might be arguable that some forms of intelligence, and uh, you know, as Professor Sandel said, there isn't really a unitary thing that we call intelligence, but certainly some problem-solving abilities may be useful for the species to have to, to get us out of some of the mess that we've created for ourselves. Uh, that, I think, could be useful. And if that were available to all parents, so not just those who could afford it, which would kind of reinforce the, um, turn the, the economic class division into a genetic class division, I don't think any of us want to see that, but if it was available for all parents, um, I'm not at all sure that that would be a bad thing. Uh, it might well be that the advantages of that would outweigh uh, whatever disadvantages we have. And I guess from that you will see that I am more prepared to say that we should, we're, we're justified in taking control of our reproduction, which present is to some extent a lottery, uh, that we would be justified in changing that for good purposes. So let me move from that to the first of, of Professor Sandel's uh, challenges to me, the first of his examples, which was to say, well, uh, if uh, you judge this on a utilitarian basis, then what was wrong with the early uh, eugenics movement which led to, to forced sterilization? And Professor Sandel talked about, well, the sterilization has to be painless and so on. Uh, so let me just clarify first. Um, the classical form of utilitarianism, uh, as developed by Jeremy Bentham, uh, 
was hedonistic. It, it simply talked in terms of pleasure or pain. And I probably sometimes sound like that, especially when I'm talking about animals, because I think their interest in not feeling pain and not suffering is the most obvious of the interests that they have. But I'm in fact a preference utilitarian rather than a hedonistic utilitarian, which means that what I'm trying to maximize is the satisfaction of preferences overall, not just the, uh, the net surplus of pleasure over pain as a hedonist would. So in the case of forced sterilization, it's certainly not enough for me that the sterilization should be painless because I would be concerned about the fact that the people being sterilized uh, presumably do not wish to be sterilized. If, if there has to be forced sterilization, that implies that they are not willing to consent to being sterilized. So there is an overriding of their preferences. Uh, the question is whether that can be justified by greater satisfaction of, of other preferences. I um, am doubtful, certainly I th don't think on the grounds that anyone had in the 20s or 30s, I don't think the science was really there. And if you look at the details of what happened, there were certainly abuses and there were certainly uh, racial biases and class biases in, in who was uh, sterilized. So um, I think that uh, there, if indeed we are concerned about um, the birth of people with who, who are in some way not going to be contributors to the benefit of society. I think there are much better and uh, uh, ways of, you, of, of changing that which appeal to people's autonomy, make things available to them. Uh, essentially, I don't think we're, we're at a position where we really need to contemplate coercing anyone to be sterilized, certainly no one who is capable of giving or refusing their consent. Um, there may be justified cases in people who are not capable of giving consent, uh, not capable of understanding the issue, where indeed uh, you know, having a child may be bad for them, especially if it's a woman, um, and uh, as well as indicating a burden on the community. So um, I think that there are, there are practical reasons in this case why a utilitarian would not go to coercive sterilization, um, given the availability of, of other tools and given questions about how we can care for the problems. But that's not to say that um, uh, you know, one rejects all of the ways in which people may choose to select their children. And uh, so I think we probably do have a disagreement uh, on some of those questions. And the thing that, that you seem to value so much, the idea that uh, the child comes as an unconditional kind of kind of gift is not something that I would place that much value on if you know if, if that's not how parents want it um, if, if parents want to have more of a role I think they can do that and and in fact I when we had the discussion earlier uh, you emphasized the idea that you were prepared to use genetic selection to avoid a variety of diseases including perhaps an expanding variety as our knowledge of genes and diseases and risks of diseases uh, expands. But that is also, in a way, wanting to tilt the lottery. That's also not saying I will accept and love my child unconditionally, no matter how that child comes. And I think there will probably be some people who would say, you've gone too far there, and they want to say, you have to accept your child unconditionally, whatever health status the child comes with. So, so clearly for you, that's, that's one value among others, and I suppose that's consistent with what you said about value pluralism, um, but I think value pluralists do need to get pushed as to what you say when there's a conflict of your values. Are the values actually comparable in some sense? Um, if so, it sounds like you have some sort of scale for comparing them, which isn't too far from a, a unitary metric. If you think they're not comparable, then does that make the choices arbitrary when you have conflicting values that are not comparable? I mean, what does that tell us about how we could actually choose? Is any choice then as good as any other? However, I do want to move on because you've given me three other challenges as well, and I want to give you a chance to reply, and then we'll no doubt still have time for questions. So, carving your initials in the ancient sequoia in a lonely corner of the forest where almost no one can see it, um, and let's assume also, of course, you know, I, I, I agree with you, I don't think sequoias can feel pain, I don't think they have that kind of nervous system. We have to assume that it's not going to damage the sequoia, it's not so deep that uh, it's, it's going to cause some infection in the sequoia that will uh, 
cause the, the, the tree to die, which would be a bad thing in ecological terms, uh, I think that would outweigh the, um, the benefits you get. I guess I think if in this case, if we really assume that the case is as you described, um, I think it's, you know, I think it's ugly, I think it's petty, it's, it's, it's kind of a sort of vandalism uh, of something beautiful, so it shows extremely poor taste. But is it morally wrong? Um, I don't... I don't really know that it is um, morally wrong. Uh, I can't see if, if, if the conditions are really as you, as you describe it. Um, genetically modifying the chickens. Um, look, uh, you'd, you'd have to do more than remove their impulse to roam freely. I mean, there's a whole lot of other impulses that they have that they can't satisfy in those cages, including laying their eggs in a kind of sheltered private nesting area, which they will always do if you give them a chance, but they can't in the cage, uh, getting away from other aggressive chickens in the cage, uh, and so on and so forth. But, but no doubt you could just say, okay, fine, well, well, we'll modify all of that as well. We basically end up turning the chicken into a kind of a, a zombie, I suppose, that um, uh, is content in the cage. I actually do think that you've now removed the, the objection to battery cages that I described when I was talking earlier today. In other words, you've now removed the animal welfare objection um, because the chickens have been so modified that they enjoy life in the cages. Uh, you haven't removed maybe, uh, you know, uh, resource use objections or environmental objections and, and so on to intensive farming, uh, and they would have to be balanced against how much we enjoy getting these eggs and the eggs being cheaper than other eggs and so on. But, yeah, I mean, if you really could do that, um, then the kind of argument that I put today has been, uh, you know, no longer has a target. I think, I think you're right about that. But I don't want to just remove the target for your argument. I want to suggest that that would, non would, would still be a monstrous thing to do. You don't seem to think it would be. No. Um, you will have to explain to me more fully why it would be a monstrous thing to do. Um, I mean, we've already modified domestic animals in a whole variety of ways um, to make them more productive for us. So I, I wonder actually whether, you know, if you're against mastery, dominion, if you think there's hubris in this, whether turning what was the Burmese jungle fowl um, into the modern chicken um, is already not an exercise of that sort of mastery and, and whether it's not already objectionable in just the same way that taking the further steps that you talked about would be objectionable. Uh, I don't know if you want to reply to that or shall I... I've only got one more, right? Yeah. The, the dog fighting, yeah. Okay, so I think um, when philosophers talk about examples like this, we can talk about um, them in two different ways. We can talk about them in a purely hypothetical way in which we say, look, so suppose we had these, d these dogs or, or roosters, whatever they were, they're fighting here, they suffer um, uh, intensely from their fighting, but there's thousands of people enjoying it, as there were you know, in, the, in the Roman Colosseum, um, where incidentally there was lots of animal fights as well before they started introducing Christians or other captives. Um, there were lots of, uh, they imported all sorts of exotic beasts to fight against each other in, in vast numbers and depopulated uh, North Africa of a lot of its wild animals to ship them over for the amusement of Romans. But, um, uh, you know, we can talk about those cases in a hypothetical way where we say, well, just imagine you've got this situation, there's 10,000 people watching these animals tear each other to pieces. They get lots of pleasure from it. The pleasure outweighs the suffering of the animals. Um, is everything okay? How could a utilitarian object? And if that's all you're talking about, if you just say, just imagine this as an example and we specify that there are no further consequences other than the pleasures of the people and the suffering of the animals, then I think the utilitarian has to say, okay, um, I have to accept that. Uh, that you know, does produce a maximum of pleasure. It's, it's pretty hard exactly how you weigh up the pleasures of that sort as against pains because we don't have a good scale, but let's just assume that somehow we agree that they outweigh it. Um, we also, of course, really would have to say, well, okay, here's a pleasure, but it gets a lot of pain as a result. Couldn't you have equal pleasure without the pain? Couldn't we, for example, invent football so that instead of having the dogs fighting, the crowds are cheering for their football team and they might get just as much pleasure out of that. Um, who knows? But then, you know, we can just say, all right, we assume that they wouldn't get so much pleasure out of that. So if we really specify the example in that way, I have to say, okay. But if we then go 
to the real world, and we say, look, we've now got thousands of people cheering on animal suffering, what is that going to do to uh, the way in which they think about others, others who they can dominate? And, you know, I mean, I share your resistance to the idea that we're entitled to dominate everything, but I share it, I suppose, because I think if we accept that, we're likely to have consequences that are bad for everyone. So, um, you know, the, when I talked earlier today, I, I talked about some of the more traditional views about what, the treatment of animals, which saw nothing wrong in cruelty to animals, people like Aquinas and Kant. But in fact, both Aquinas and Kant thought that it was wrong to be cruel to animals, not for the sake of the animals, but because it would lead people to be cruel to other humans. And they thought that was bad. Well, for me, that's a sort of not the real heart of the argument, obviously. The, the suffering of animals, for me, is the heart of the argument. But I, I can't really imagine that you could have a culture in which thousands of people enjoyed uh, watching animals tear each other to pieces that did not have some effect on their behavior in other circumstances, both to animals and to subordinate human beings who were in their power. Uh, and that that's why if we shift from the purely hypothetical case to the real world, um, I would think dogfighting is something that we ought to stop. If I could just reply to, to a couple of those uh, points, starting with the last one, that, there, uh, that w we should be concerned in the dogfighting case not only with the cruelty, the pain, sorry, the pain and suffering of the animals, but we should also be alive to other adverse consequences, effects on behavior, a kind of coarsening if people get in the habit of thrilling to cruelty to animals, then it could well be the case that they will, um, that the, the coarsening effect will cause them to countenance forms of cruelty and violence in the streets after they leave the arena and so on. And those consequences could, would themselves be cause suffering or pain or the frustration of people's preferences uh, and we should crank that in to uh, increase, crank that into the moral calculus. What I would like to, and I think that's a perfectly reasonable and legitimate secondary effect, uh, legitimate consideration. The difference is, I, I would also like to um, insist on a third kind of consideration here in addition to the pain suffered by the animals, and in addition to secondary effects, what people do when they leave the stadium, having been coarsened in this way, what a, isn't there something morally troubling about uh, encouraging a society in which people take pleasure in this kind of thing? A moral, something morally troubling that goes beyond what those people may or may not do when they go out onto the streets mugging or assaulting other people having been coarsened. We were talking after Professor Singer's uh, colloquium talk uh, about the Puritan uh, grounds for opposing bear baiting, which was their version of dog fighting. And the Puritans uh, uh, opposed uh, bear baiting not, not because of the pain it cost the bear, but because of the pleasure it gave the, the, the Puritans, the bear baiters, the onlookers. I think they were on to something. They were on to something which really goes to the heart of the difference in our whole approach, I think, to ethics and moral philosophy. Um, I agree we should concern ourselves with the pain to the bears or the dogs and to the secondary effects, the violence that might be a spillover effect on the streets of Rome after the spectacle in the Colosseum. But I also think that part of what we should care about, part of what moral philosophy should attend to, are the qualities of character, the habits, the virtues, the attitudes and dispositions of people. And it seems to me that part of what's wrong with the dogfighting is that People who become accustomed to taking pleasure in that kind of activity are the lesser for it. There is a, it's a defect of character to thrill to a bloody spectacle of that kind. And that's an independent further reason to, to discourage it. And this worry about character and habits and dispositions and virtues, 
I don't think can be collapsed into or fully captured by even the secondary effects and consequences, and yet it seems to me a great mistake to rule it out of moral consideration. And it's that ethic, an ethic that worries about attitudes, dispositions, qualities of character, the right way to live a life, the right sort of things to take pleasure in that lead me to take seriously the, the effect on character of the drive to create designer children. What about, what about character, virtue, attitudes, well, dispositions as an independent moral concern? I mean, I, sh I share your idea that, that there's, there's something that we find disquieting about the fact that people are taking pleasure in cruelty here. But I don't know how to examine that intuition in such a way that proves that it's an independent value and not simply something that I have and I hope other people have because of the first two of the reasons that, that you talked about. That is, the, the fact that, that if people have this character, they're more likely to cause unnecessary pain to animals and maybe they're, they're more likely to cause it to humans as well. I, I don't know how we can examine ourselves and say, look, it's not just that. Because you know, we have evolved in circumstances, we've developed, our culture has developed in circumstances where the, these consequences have followed. So it wouldn't be surprising if we have this sense that something is intrinsically wrong, and yet that sense is not reliable if we reflect more carefully on what the values are that we really want to hold. Let me just push a little further. You say, yes, it's bad that people take pleasure in this kind of bloody sport, but their pleasure is outweighed, typically would be outweighed, both by the, by the pain to the animal and the secondary consequences. Why would you, and yet, to decide whether that practice is morally objectionable or not, you still do weigh preferences overall, and you still do count, don't you, the perverse, as I would call them, the perverse preferences. You count them. I do count them. Yeah. And you weigh them, yeah. and you accord them the same moral weight as you accord the non-perverse preferences that people have who want to shut it down because they're worried about the consequences. Isn't that morally odd? No, I don't. Why, why do you want to weigh those perverse preferences at all in deciding whether this is a good thing? Even if we're lucky and it turns out that the secondary effects are big enough so that we can condemn it in the end. Right. Well, I suppose the answer is because I want people to have their preferences satisfied, other things being equal. Even if they're bad, perverse, awful preferences? I Why do you want to give them weight at all? Because the, the badness or, or... Well, firstly, I think the idea of perverse is sort of a, a difficult one here. I mean, I'm not quite sure what that means. Apart but in this case, you don't dispute that it is a perverse preference, do you? I would not use that term. I would. You wouldn't really? Even in this case? I mean, uh, well, if you're saying perverse, you mean it's a perversion, right? I want to know what... A, a perversion normally means something that is contrary to what's normal. Um, I'm not at all sure, actually, that throughout human cultures and history it's abnormal to take pleasure from animal suffering. Um, I hope that you're right, but I have no great confidence. I have no commitment to the idea that we're sort of so basically good that it, there's not something a cruel, sadistic streak in our nature. Um, so if, if it is in our nature, then I don't think you can justifiably say it's perverse. Well, by it's normal, incredible. I wouldn't say empirically, sociologically, or historically familiar. I wouldn't define normal that way. There might be certain perverse practices might be normal or historically prevalent or familiar. Uh, don't we want to... What, what I think the difference between us is that you don't want to judge the quality or the merits or the worth of those preferences. You just want to weigh them against the bad effects and hope that the bad effects will be uh, powerful enough to outweigh these preferences about which you don't really want to be judgmental. I want to judge those preferences. Right. I want to criticize right. those and, preferences. And, and you need to judge them by some standard other than whether they conduce to maximal preference satisfaction yes. Yes. overall. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I don't that really... That it's no way to live or be. 
But see, I don't see where that comes from, where, where that idea that this is somehow no way to live or be actually comes from. I would want to know more about what's the basis for that judgment. Um, you need to have a foundation, which I haven't yet seen. And if you're, well, all right, maybe, may I, I don't know, are we going on to? I'm not sure uh, whether the, I can right. see some hands right. waving. Some people but are saying more, some people right. are trying to could get I into the discussion. All right, <laughs> could, could I take up one of the other, uh, I'll just take up sure. one of the yeah. other uh, points. Back on the uh, forced sterilization, the traditional eugenics, um, you, you said, well, there were, it wouldn't be enough, and you're sh surely right about this, that it be painless the forced sterilization, because we also have to take into account that the victims of the forced sterilization programs in about the 30, 30 plus American states that did this, um, they didn't want it, and so they were, their preferences were overridden. And you pointed out, rightly, there were abuses, there were racial biases in who was singled out for forced sterilization and so on. If we accept the idea that what matters morally is to satisfy preferences overall and to give equal consideration to preferences without judging the preferences, as, as I want to do, then let's take the case even of the racially biased and motivated forced sterilizations. Let's say that in some cases, eugenics, even eugenic reasons, were just a cover. We're just a, if you can imagine, respectable fig leaf for sterilizing racial minorities. A and the, sat the preferences being satisfied, or that were motivating the policy, were racist preferences. Now, if the victims were few enough if the minority was small enough and the racist preferences were prevalent enough, and if your only standard for morality is satisfying preferences overall, wouldn't you have to defend and justify morally a purely unabashedly racist program of forced sterilization if the preferences were distributed in that way? Well, see, I think you have to consider how you can produce in the longer run a, a better society, a society in which everyone can live. Now, um, if there is a racial minority in that society and they're being discriminated against and they're the victim of racial prejudice in various ways, I think you have to combat that prejudice because you're never going to get to a state uh, which produces uh, the, the greatest possible satisfaction of the preferences of everyone concerned if you tolerate the racist prejudices. So, but why, uh, why not? What assures that? It's a small minority, let's say, and there are a great many people who harbor the racist preferences. But see, I think, I think whereas... What know, gives you that confidence? I mean, I, that I, 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 think, I think the racist preferences are more malleable than the preferences of the minority to be able to live a, a reasonable life. I, I think we've seen that in, in Amer recent American history. You know, I mean, if people would have said, maybe what, 60 years ago, people would have said, well, you know, there's the preferences of all these white Southerners. They don't want to sit down in the same restaurant next to a, next to a black person. Um, that's going to be a terrible thing for them and they're going to hate that. And, you know, so we have to sacrifice the preferences of, of blacks. Um, in fact, once legislation came in, they were no longer ma able to maintain uh, segregation of, of that sort, people pretty rapidly adjusted. And, you know, nobody thinks twice now, you know, even in Atlanta or, or Birmingham or wherever it might be, um, nobody thinks twice about the fact that they're uh, in a racially integrated restaurant or, or bus or whatever it might be. So um, I think we can change those preferences and we've produced a better society by changing them, whereas if we'd simply handed to them and said, look, there's more of, more of the whites than of the blacks, and so that should, you know, then, then the situation would have continued. We would have had that situation of uh, failure to satisfy the preferences overall. But how do we know which preferences we should pander to? Actually, even to pander to preferences seems to presuppose that we can judge independently 
bad or perverse preferences. We, d we don't speak about pandering to elevated preferences. We right. <laughs> so even to speak about pandering to preferences presupposes, doesn't it, that you are illicitly on my side. You judge preferences, which no. is why, you're, why you want to change those racist ones ind for independent reasons. And it just turns out that once we do manage to change them, well, you can say, well, now there's an overall higher level of satisfaction than what? Than there was at the time? Maybe, maybe not. How do you measure that? Than there would have been if you had preserved Jim Crow laws? Well, maybe, maybe not. That would depend on numbers in large part. Why, when you say pander to preferences, you disputed when I was talking about perverse preferences. Mm -hmm. But to pander to preferences without knowing in the future how the calculus will turn out, and you can't know for sure, then w how can you even speak about pandering to preferences without judging them? Well, there, there are preferences in this case which said that, that we, don't give, uh, we, don't, we don't give other people um, in, our, in our community the same sort of status, and we, don't, we, don't, we want to keep them in a situation where uh, they are inferior to us. Now, I think that that is something which is going to go against the general trend that I talked about of equal consideration of interest. It's conceivable, I agree, that the calculation could come out that you can't actually do anything that is going to improve the overall satisfaction. But um, I think that they're, they're, they're preferences that clearly show a prejudice which is not uh, well founded you know you can you can look at the things that racists say about people of minority races and they generally tend to be things that uh, are based on myths and false beliefs and it's it's in that sense that i would say you're you're pandering to them you're accepting them at face value where really you should be criticizing them because they are a blockage in the way of getting to a state that's better for all um, I still, I agree with you that's dependent on certain facts about human nature and if, as I said before in the case of the dog fighting, if the facts about human nature were different, um, you know, maybe a racially stratified society would be conceivable, uh, conceivably justified, but, but the way human beings are, that seems to me not the case. I, well, let's see whether I can't tempt you to share some of my intuitions, which is one way of dealing with these kinds of cases. I've, I've read of a sport, it's a, a variant of, of a polo that is, I think, played in Afghanistan, if I'm not mistaken, where the people ride on horses, is it horses or camels, I don't know which, and they use a, uh, what is it, it's a dead goat or something to, whack, to uh, I don't know, whack the, the polo ball or whatever it is. Now it's a dead, I think it's a goat, maybe someone knows who studies sociology about this. Um, <laughs> So, it's not that the goat is experiencing pain, it's dead already. And yet, there is something grim about that practice, wouldn't you agree? Yeah. And, <laughs> and yet, it's not that the interests of that goat are somehow not being considered. Let's assume it was killed painlessly before the match began. Well, I mean, it, it's still a goat. It still was a sentient being. Why was it killed? Was it killed to play this game? Um, uh, you know, I think those questions are, are still... Well, but those aren't the only questions, Peter. Look, we can up the ante. <laughs> we, no, well, we, okay, can, so, we so can up the ante. No, w let's assume that the, that the creature being used as the polo stick died of natural causes, and let's assume it's not a goat. Let's assume it's a human being. But died of natural causes, causes painlessly, not for the sake of this game, but it was available and, oh, the, the, uh, the, let's say the, the family sold it for the purpose. <laughs> okay, so so I, I guess we, we have cultural traditions of respect for what we do with the bodies of our ancestors and families that this violates. Um, I think probably it is because it's a cultural tradition here. I actually don't think that there's something intrinsically wrong. I mean, there's, there's nothing morally objectionable in that. Not intrinsically. I mean, really? It's, it's this famous, you know, it's this famous example, isn't it, in Herodotus, where, um, where uh, he recounts how the, the Emperor Darius liked to challenge people, and he, 
he brought some people from one end of his empire, the Greeks, I think, and said, uh, how much would I have to pay you to eat the bodies of your dead ancestors? And they said, don't speak of such a thing. It's, it's the most shocking thing you could imagine. Uh, would you know some would uh, enable me to do that. Then he brought in some Indians from the other end of his empire, and he said, how much would I have to pay you to burn the bodies of your ancestors? And, and they said, oh, don't talk about such a horrendous thing to do. And they, of course, were in the custom of eating the bodies of their ancestors. Um, I think uh, in either of those cultures, either of those practices was perfectly appropriate, which is the point that Herodotus draws from it. I think in that area where actually there's no suffering because they are dead and they don't care and it's what the culture regards as appropriate, um, to that extent, the custom, custom is king. Um, so if, in fact, it is the custom in a certain culture that the most honourable thing that can happen to your dead ancestor is that he be used as a polo stick. <laughs> it's the culture here to give some people in the audience an opportunity to make a comment or ask a question. And uh, there's a student here who's been burning to ask you both a question. Please. Okay, did people hear the question? That, that I'm suggesting that there is a proper way or an appropriate way for human beings to treat, say, chickens that isn't fully captured by the interests or the capacity for suffering, how, apart from culturally determined practices, can we reason about that um, rather than just citing the convention? And it's a, it's a great and difficult question. And I would answer in two ways. Uh, I think there are two ways of going about reasoning about the uh, appropriate or proper way uh, for human beings to treat um, other human beings, uh, animals, or for that matter, um, the natural world. What we need really to rethink, and th these are the broader political stakes, uh, are not just the consequences of despoiling the environment and the natural world, the consequences for ourselves or for future generations, but also if we really want to generate an ethic for the environment and for the natural world, I think we do have to um, think about, uh, reflect on the proper stance of human beings toward the natural world, including animals, non-human animals, human beings, but for that matter, the natural world as such. And to generate that kind of eth ethic, I think we have to reflect not just on interests, but also on proper attitudes. Now, how to reason about proper attitudes rather than just invoke custom, here's how they do it here, here's how they did it back then. Um, two ways, first, um, we can reason case by case and reason by analogy and see whether we share certain moral intuitions about appropriate and inappropriate treatment, whether of the sequoia or of the dead goat used as the polo stick, case by case and explore, as we've just been doing here, whether we actually do share certain moral intuitions and then insofar as we do, what account can we give of the basis of those intuitions. So in the course of having our exchange, we were inviting each other, offering cases and counterexamples to see whether we could find a case where there was a shared moral intuition and then whether we could agree on the reasons for that intuition. Or we encounter a case where we have different moral intuitions or where we have the same but give different accounts. That's one way in which moral reasoning about proper attitudes or ways of treating the natural world can proceed case by case, exploring the reasons and principles lying behind shared intuitions where we find them. But you may also, and this is the second way of answering that question, you might say, well, is there some general approach, general way of thinking, not just case by case, appealing to intuitions, trying to sort out the moral base of those intuitions? And here I would say, um, I do think, I mean, lying behind the view I've been urging, there is a general principle, which is the meaning of respect, what it is to respect a person or an animal or a creature or a being or, for that matter, uh, nature, is to treat that creature or being in accordance with its nature, 
we do wrong when we treat persons or animals, or I would say sequoias, or the earth itself in a way that is at odds with their nature. Now, this is a very difficult general principle to make out, not because there are disagreements about how to apply it. That's true of all principles. But because it does invoke a certain idea, a certain idea that the uh, teleological idea, going back to Aristotle, that the, the way to think about ethics and proper ways of treating or standing vis-a-vis -vis the natural world depends on reasoning about the purpose or the function or the ends of uh, the natural world or the creatures and beings within that world. That's not an easy thing to do. We have to proceed case by case and so on. So that would be the general answer I would give. Well, um, I think that's really interesting, that closing remark that you made, or the, the, the point about dealing with things according to their nature, because I think it does show uh, the, the difference between us in, in the kind of approach. And I have to say I'm a little surprised by it and, and puzzled, because I actually thought that Aristotle's teleological view of the universe was exploded by Darwin and that we don't think anymore that the universe has a purpose and therefore we don't think that things in it have an overall purpose in the Aristotelian sense in which those of you who were at my early morning sessions I put up this quote from Aristotle about plants exist for the sake of man uh, sorry, for the sake of the animals, and the animals exist for the sake of man. Um, and I think, you know, that was just a mistake. Um, uh, we understand now that these things came into existence uh, as a result of a process that had no conscious purpose or direction. They evolved um, in different ways, and uh, those whose descendants managed to survive and reproduce, uh, there are many of them, and those that didn't aren't here. Um, but there isn't a kind of moral purpose in nature. Um, we can certainly, you know, find value in some aspects of it and our own purposes. But uh, I don't understand really how you would find a sort of moral valence out of the purpose of nature. There. Right. All right. So this is the beginning of a, maybe next year's colloquium. <laughs> but Darwin versus teleological accounts of nature. But I would just reply briefly as follows. There is a certain Aristotelian idea that was exploded by Darwin, and that's the idea that it's possible to read a purpose wholesale into nature as such, and that the way we glean the purposes of things, plants, animals, human beings, the natural world, stones, everything, uh, is to study biology and to read out the essential purpose from nature through a kind of biological inquiry. That's the part that, what, that essentialism is what was overthrown by Darwin. I agree. But I think it's a mistake to conclude from the rejection of that essentialist view of nature that teleological explanation and moral reasoning as such has been discredited. So take, for example, the discussion about designer children and parents and the relation of parents and children and whether the norm of unconditional love is the appropriate way that parents should treat children. Now, we could have an argument about that norm, whether it is the proper way of characterizing the way parents should relate to children. And that argument would be a teleological argument. It would be an argument about what good parents are, what parents are for vis-a-vis -vis their children. So it would be teleological, not in the old-fashioned pre-Darwinian Aristotelian sense that we could just read out from nature or from biology the answer to that question. The argument about the proper, what it is to be a good parent, what parents are for, would be a moral argument, and it would proceed by offering reasons, examples, counterexamples. Uh, it would involve moral reasoning, not just reading from nature. It would be an argument about what is the nature of the practice of parenting. How should it be understood? So it would be teleological moral reasoning 
though it wouldn't just be saying there is some essence of parenthood that if we study nature closely enough, we'll know. That is the part that's been overthrown. But I wouldn't say that teleological reasoning as such has been overthrown in virtue of that. I'm afraid that the hour is such that we should uh, hold Professor Sandel to his suggestion and since we didn't get dissent from Professor Singer, uh, assume uh, his uh, uh, implicit agreement. That is that we've got to get both these people back again. <laughs> we obviously have a lot more to say to you and you clearly have an enormous amount to say to us. And we want to thank you very, very much for <laughs>